My name is Mike O'Connor. I'm the editor of Australian Photography, and I'd like to welcome you all to a very special webinar this evening, which is supported by our good friends at Sandisk. Tonight, I'm joined by Mark Gaylor from Melbourne, who I'll hand over to in just a minute. But first, a little bit of housekeeping. Mark's presentation should last for about 30 to 35 minutes, and then we'll have a short session for questions, which you can put through in the comments thread in Zoom. If you don't get time to ask a question, you can always email them to us afterwards, and I'll share the email address for where you can do this in the comments as well. This includes any tech questions for Sandus too. We're happy to answer them. Um, and we're also making a recording of this presentation as well. So if you want to watch it again later, that's perfectly fine. Finally, we have a giveaway this evening. I've got 50 of these uh, 128 gig SanDisk micro SD cards uh, for the first 50 people who email us with our special keyword. Mark will say that at a point during his presentation. And again, I'll put all the details for what you need to do to go in the drawer in the comments section as well. So let's get started. Why workflows? Although it's probably one of those topics that isn't quite as exciting as shooting or editing, it's still a really important one, especially so as we get used to larger megapixel cameras with their larger file sizes. These files can fill up inbuilt storage on laptops and hard drives quickly, meaning that if you're shooting regularly, having a system to manage your files is so critical. At the same time, having a portable kit is also important to ensure your workflow is as efficient as possible from shoot to edit and to export. And that's something Mark's gonna to touch on now too. Now, as well as being a long-term contributor to Australian photography and one of our Photographer of the Year judges, Mark is also a seasoned presenter, author, YouTuber, and ambassador for Sony Australia. Mark, I'm gonna hand over to you now. Um, okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. So uh, let's, uh, let's see where I'm going. Okay. Okay, so um, you should be able to uh, see my uh, title slide there. So, uh, and I've just put in that uh, better workflows for photographers, but also traveling light. This is something that I'm quite passionate about is not to take more gear uh, on location or while traveling and, unless it's absolutely necessary. So uh, I was out on a field trip last year with Mike O'Connor in um, the sand dunes of Cervantes. And um, Mike O'Connor grabbed this shot of um, a group of us who had uh, scaled up one of the sand dunes. And uh, when I saw his image, I said, oh, look, I'm the one in the middle. And Mike said, how do you know you're the one in the middle? And I said, I'm the only one not carrying a backpack or a large tripod. I'm basically carrying a messenger bag. And if I do have a tripod, it will be a very small tripod. So I've always been passionate about um, carrying light portable cameras. And so I, I embrace the mirrorless move and the cameras I'm using now uh, are no heavier than the cameras I started my career ago in uh, 40 years ago. They're basically the same size and same weight. Obviously, they have a lot more features and uh, they have menus uh, that the older style cameras didn't have. But it's that um, size and weight in the hand that I feel most comfortable carrying. So, uh, of course, uh, I do value the larger sensor sizes and you just have to do your homework here. Reducing the size of the sensor doesn't always mean you're going to reduce the size of the kit. Now, uh, Sony have managed to reduce their camera size, but of course, it's, that's only half of the equation. The other half of the equation for me is also uh, the length, choice of lenses. So uh, what I'm doing is I'm traveling uh, particularly with primes just because they're lighter, uh, more portable and less weight in the hand. I really don't mind changing the lenses. I'd rather do this than carry a 10 times zoom and double or triple the weight of the camera in the hand. So my lens of choice is, uh, and it doesn't really matter whether you're Sony or not, uh, all of the manufacturers uh, do this, is they offer these uh, F1.8 primes. They're so much lighter than the 1.4 and they're all so much cheaper. But typically you can get some really sharp examples of these primes. So uh, the other lens that I'm surprisingly using at the moment is also a very small kit lens. I think the manufacturers are learning how to make full frame lenses, but um, get them to collapse in on themselves. So they take up less room in the bag. One of the things that is happening, of course, is these lenses aren't as optically perfect as a prime, 
but often the software that we're using will correct any imperfections like barrel distortion as is just 167 grams. So the main reason that I do like using the full frame is uh, I don't want to carry a flash. I will use flash when necessary, but I don't really want to put that in my bag. So in low ambient lights, this, these uh, images were captured while I was in quarantine uh, returning from the UK. It doesn't really matter whether I'm using 800 ISO so, or as in this instance, uh, 10,000 ISO, um, I don't really um, get out of the comfort zone of a full frame sensor. So uh, I'll give you a, a quick uh, glimpse of my entire uh, kit that fits in my messenger bag here, which is that light portable full frame camera kit lens, two primes, a couple of ND filters and a tabletop tripod. This tabletop tripod never actually sees a table. My favorite vantage point for landscape photography is very low to the ground. So I really don't mind the tripod being that small and the advantage is it'll fit in my pocket or inside my camera bag. Because the cameras are so light I'll use wrist straps instead of neck straps. I'll carry a spare battery. Um, usually the batteries are good these days but I'll often be photographing more than eight hours a day. And of course um, um, a million cards with me, I will take a, a backup drive, an external backup drive. And these have got so much more affordable and lighter and smaller in recent years. And uh, obviously the SanDisk one terabyte drive is, is a good companion. So uh, I find myself working with a messenger bag in that uh, shot of Mike O'Connor. This was the messenger bag that I'm using. Notice all of that kit has gone into the messenger bag, um, except um, the light portable one terabyte drive from SanDisk. I always keep that on me. Occasionally the camera bag might be in the boot of a car or a hotel room. And I do risk having all of that gear stolen, but I've always... If you're using um, extra SD cards, you could just pop those into your wallet. But one of the great things about this external drive from SanDisk is it is very durable. It's uh, weatherproof, waterproof, dustproof, and uh, will take a two meter shock. Um, if you drop it. So the bag isn't very crowded, as you can see, the bag is no bigger than um, uh, at the length of an iPad. And that is another way of shaving weight uh, off your kit when you're traveling. I don't just do this um, editorial style um, light work. I will occasionally do action, sports, um, bird photography, and generally that kit will go into a completely separate bag. Uh, so I've got an A92 in a little backpack there. It's one of the smaller backpacks. And you'll see the total kit size there is actually seven kilos, which just happens to be the carry-on weight when I'm traveling by air. So here's a quick look at some of the small tripods I own. Uh, there also isn't one in, uh, that goes over a kilo, including the head. The one I'm currently using in that little messenger bag is the second from the left there, that Leo photo, the MT-03. It's basically just a very good build of something like a Manfrotto Pixie, which, as you probably are aware, is very uh, a plastic version of that. So this is uh, me in action in Alaska. Um, and uh, you'll see my favorite vantage point for landscape is down on the ground. I could hand hold this shot like the guy in the yellow uh, rain jacket there um, because um, I can hand hold those um, slower shutter speeds at F11. Um, but occasionally I'll put uh, the camera on that uh, tripod with an ND filter so I can smooth out uh, the busy waters. So the eye sculpture becomes heroic because of that low vantage point. The foreground uh, it comes into the landscape, so we get a sense of place. You know where I'm, I'm uh, squatting to take this landscape photograph. We get a sense of where this uh, iceberg is on the beach. Okay, let's, um, okay, so you probably realize I do travel a lot and obviously I'm always uh, backing up and I'm archiving and I'm storing my images and I'm also working on the images as I move around. Now, one of the things that you may consider, and this isn't going to be an option for everyone, is Lightroom for a tablet has become very feature rich over the last 18 months. So much so there isn't a lot missing compared to the 
classic version that we're currently using on our desktop and laptop computers. So, and if you choose this option, you are going to shave off uh, maybe um, a kilogram of weight in your total pack. Now, obviously, one of the disadvantages of um, buying these tablets with large storage is when you ask um, uh, Apple for another terabyte of storage on these things, they're going to charge you an arm and a leg. It's also better to actually have that extra storage as a separate device. So you're not putting all of your eggs in one basket. Okay, so uh, most of you will probably still remain with the old laptop workflow. I, a few years back, I, re I reduced the size of my laptop from 15 inch to 13 inch as I'm reducing uh, the size of my backpacks into messenger bags. And so um, I'm now using a 13 inch MacBook Pro. Okay, so here comes the keywords. So if you've if you've stuck with me this long, you'll uh, you'll know that there's a special offer. Um, is that um, people who know these keywords and they're smarter workflows. Those are the two keywords. You do need to email those uh, keywords into Australian Photography. That's contact at australianphotography.com. And uh, just mention the keywords. Also um, mention your mailing address because they're not going to be able to post that to you unless uh, they have your mailing address. And um, Mike um, will uh, drop the address, I'm sure, in the chat pod as well. Okay, this is a very busy slide, but we're getting um, we're getting down to the nitty gritty here. Uh, as we're shooting with the uh, high resolution cameras, we're amassing large amounts of data. Now, if you haven't replaced your memory cards for some while, you're probably working with a UHS-1, an, an SDHC or an SDXC memory card. And I suspect the, the fastest uh, read-write speeds of those cards is 95 megabytes per second. But something's been happening in recent years. Um, a lot of the camera manufacturers now are putting in UHS-2 uh, card slots in their cameras. The, these can use the SDXC2 cards, and these have uh, read write speeds going up to 300 megabytes per second. So basically, we can move our images from our camera potentially to our laptop or to our external drive three times faster than we could before. Again, if you're getting, uh, if you have an older style camera, the in-out port on the side of that camera is most likely to be USB 2, which is restricted to 60 megabytes per second. So if you've got a fast card, you're not going to be able to utilize the write speed, the 300 megabytes per second, if you're connecting the camera directly to your laptop. You are going to need to eject that card and put it into a very fast USB 3 or USB C card reader. In that way, you should be able to facilitate up to 500 megabytes per second. Um, obviously, the cards keep getting faster. So you are going to future proof yourself if we're um, basically buying storage devices and transfer devices that are faster than the write speeds of our cards. So um, if we move uh, beyond the camera, moving to the right, you'll see that the camera actually has a USB-C in-out port. Sony have actually dropped the, um, the USB-2 ports from the side of their modern cameras now. But um, many manufacturers, um, it's, it's Nikon and it's Sony, and there'll be additional manufacturers, are also moving um, into different ports or memory card slots on their cameras cameras, which are um, CF Express. And now we're going to see uh, read write speeds in excess of 700 megabytes per second. What this means is we can get uh, all of our files over to our, um, uh, our storage device or our laptop so much quicker, you know, 10, 20, 30 times faster than we did before. So the extreme pro version, the pro version of this extreme uh, external drive has um, is now um, advertising that it's increasing its data transfer rate from 1000 megabytes per second to 2000 megabytes per second. Now, um, if you've uh, been around photography for a while, you'll know that there's um, a rule called the 321 rule, which says you need three copies of every file you value on two different media, and one of those should be off site. So that if you lose all of your gear, you still have that one copy off site. 
that could be cloud storage, but if you've tried uploading, um, you know, uh, uh, half a terabyte worth of raw files over a motel room in Alaska, you'll realize that is not always a great or a feasible option. So still the, ex the fast external drive is still going to be necessary for most photographers. And as I say, when I've got those images on my external drive, I will leave the hotel room with that drive. And you see that is actually in the coin section of the pocket of my jeans uh, on, a, on a little um, uh, uh, a connection there. So I will don't risk losing it um, uh, if, um, if I fall over, the, the drive isn't going to fall out onto the floor. It's basically attached to me. Okay, so um, some people will say, well, you just take extra SD cards. Well, if you're looking at a terabyte worth of storage, you're going to have to buy a lot of fast SD cards to match uh, the SanDisk external drive. And just remember, the SanDisk external drive is likely to be much more rugged than your cards. Um, so you might be wanting to put those in a card wallet to keep them safe, but the, um, the external drive from SanDisk doesn't need uh, to be treated with, with um, cotton wool or kid gloves. You're, you're basically um, uh, can put that in your pocket alongside your phone and that is durable. Okay, so one terabyte of storage, and it comes in at a price point that obviously is much cheaper than buying massive amounts of cards. So um, uh, as I we, we get to some uh, performance figures now, now their um, SanDisk are claiming twice the speed of their their older extreme um, external drive. Now, if I've got 5,024 megapixel files on this 128 megabyte card, if I'm coming through a very fast connection uh, via the computer to the external drive, it's going to take me approximately 10 minutes to move the full contents of a full uh, SD card, 128 gigabyte card. Now, what is the limiting factor here is the right speed of the card not the external drive. So I am sort of limiting myself to a maximum of 300 megabytes per second. So it's very important to um, stress here, the limiting factor is not in the external drive itself. If the files are already being transferred to maybe a computer, if I'm then moving them over to the external drive, they're gonna move considerably faster. So you're gonna um, um, move them more than twice as fast on a, on a even on a two, three year old laptop. And again, the limiting factor to the speed of transfer is not the external drive. It's actually the computer you're moving that data. Um, even with a two, three year old uh, MacBook Pro, you're gonna be moving like a one gigabyte per second. So um, it does take slightly longer to move thousands of raw files than um, half a dozen um, video files. Um, the, uh, the, the transfer process does require that it counts the files before it starts moving the files. So it will slow the process down slightly. So the next few slides, I want to talk about integrating um, this um, uh, external drive into your post-production workflow. So this is again a bit of a busy slide, but I'll take you from left to right here. If you just plug in your external drive, Lightroom by default isn't going to acknowledge that that drive is connected. So you do have to, the first time you use it, and it's only, you only have to do this once, is you have to tell Lightroom that there is a drive that you're giving it permission to use. So in the library module of Lightroom, you click on the add folder, um, you um, browse to your external drive, which is connected. You can put a new folder on that external drive, call it photos or whatever you want, and then um, create that folder and then choose that folder. So it's a three-step process there. And then when once that folder has been chosen, you'll see the SanDisk Extreme Pro lit up to say it's connected. It's currently got no files in it, but this is where I don't have to drag files over one at a time. I can drag folders of files onto that drive. Now I do need to stress here, you're not copying the files, you're moving the files. You're basically freeing up hard drive space on your laptop. And if you've got an eagle eye there, you'll see I'm down to only 10% of my memory left on this MacBook Pro when I decided to move the files 
over to the extreme pro here. So I'm buying back precious hard uh, drive capacity. If you don't uh, buy back your hard drive capacity, you will slow down Lightroom. Lightroom needs a large amount of free space on your hard drive to work quickly. This is where um, we're now coming to uh, why we are choosing such a fast drive. You'll see that the files now are on the, um, the Extreme Pro and I can navigate, I can rate, I can edit these files extremely quickly because of the read write speed of the drive and this will run as fast as your computer is able it's absolutely the next best thing to having the files on the computer themselves okay so what i invite you to do is to go into the catalog settings in the preferences just to remind yourself where your catalog actually lives on your computer you can do that by clicking on the show button. You can see here it's in my pictures folder on my Mac. But then more importantly, come down to the backup and choose either next time or every time Lightroom exits from that pull down menu. Um, this means that when you next quit Lightroom, Lightroom will invite you to back your catalog up. Now I do stress here, you're not backing up your images, you're backing up all of the EXIF data, the metadata, the thumbnails, the previews, all of your editing information as a backup catalog, but not the files themselves. Now the files are already on your external drive, but what we're doing now is we're creating a backup for the catalog also on that external drive. So if somebody was to steal my laptop, then I've got all of my photos, but I've also got a copy or a backup of my catalog as well. Okay, so um, uh, what we're doing uh, and we're looking at now is just it's sometimes good to get a, an idea, a mental picture of what is actually happening here. So I'm just going uh, into the Extreme Pro and seeing that we've now got two folders. I've got a folder where the photos are going and I've got a folder where the catalog backups going. Now Lightroom might invite you to backup every time and you don't need to keep very old backups. You only need to really keep one or two backups of that catalog. Um, Lightroom doesn't delete old backups automatically. So you will have to go into this folder and periodically um, delete, manually delete old backups. So you don't uh, chew up all of the uh, capacity of your one terabyte drive. Okay, so um, what we're doing now is uh, looking at um, obviously just reminding you that uh, the camera, the SD card in the camera is really just temporary storage. We are going to format that card and we're going to not have files on that card. The problem with uh, SD storage in um, tablets and in laptops is it's uh, limited storage and it's expensive storage. So absolutely the most sensible way of increasing your storage capacity is to use an external drive. Now these um, uh, SSD drives are much, much smaller lighter than the old optical drives. So you are going to be able to, as I say, carry these in your pocket. Now, once you've got that workflow established, you probably want to move to a slightly different workflow than you've been using before. And that is every time you import new photos from your camera, you don't put them on your laptop at all. You straight, you transfer them directly to the external drive. There is no need to store them on the uh, the laptop itself so you once you've done that if you I, if i walk you through that screen grab of the light lightroom import dialog there i'm coming from my sd card i'm copying the files and they're going directly to the extreme pro you can simply just uh, click on that where it's um, uh, highlighted the extreme pro you can click on that uh, down um, drop down menu and just browse uh, to your extreme pro and decide uh, where the files are going. You can then create um, an import preset at the bottom of the dialog box. So you don't have to worry about um, uh, the, this workflow again. You just click on your imp import preset and your photos are always going to the same place. Now, for those people who um, either want to, first of all, copy the files to their uh, laptop, or they want to create a second set of files to a second hard drive, 
to get that three copies of everything they value. There is an option in the Lightroom workflow, which is to make a second copy on import. So you could have one copy go to one external drive, another set of raw files going to a second external drive, or you could have one going to the laptop and one going to the external drive. This way that even if you've decided first off to work on the files on your laptop, you're still going down to the pub in the evening with a copy of your files in your pocket. I have to say, this is the only way I can sleep at night now because my cameras are insured, but my memories are not. Okay, so this is where we really get into the need for speed now is if those files are on the external drive and the external drive is connected to my laptop, I am editing 24, 42, 60 megapixel files and, it, and Lightroom isn't complaining that they're on an old USB 2 drive struggling to communicate very slowly at 60 megabytes per second, not 1000 or 2000 megabytes per second. You can see that speed is really critical in this part of the workflow. And there's a picture of my vulture uh, that I captured on my most recent trip. Now, before you eject the external drive to put it in your pocket so you can go down the pub, what I would um, um, invite you to do is just um, select all of the thumbnails in the library module where you've been editing and just do the old keyboard shortcut for saving. It doesn't matter whether you, it's a keyboard shortcut you've learned for a Word document or PowerPoint, just do a Command S on a Mac or Control S on a PC. What this does is it saves all of your edits back to the raw files, not just the catalog, but the raw files themselves will hold the edited information. In this way, if you do lose your laptop, you won't have to re-edit the files. When you import them into a new catalog or um, use your backup uh, catalog, the files will appear in their edited state. Now there is a, a work, um, an important part of the workflow and this was um, pure genius, I think, on the part of Adobe. And that is the ability to create mini uh, raw files. Uh, they actually refer to them as smart previews. They're only two and a half K, two and a half thousand pixels wide, but they're enough to edit them on your laptop with the original files offline on your external drive that is not connected to your, um, to your uh, 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 computer. Okay, so um, just um, we are um, taking a look at um, an, another reminder that if you are editing your files offline and you glance over to the Extreme Pro, you'll notice the little light has gone out, basically saying it's offline. Question marks will appear on your folders. Basically, your Lightroom catalog say those folders are not connected, but you will not be prevented if you have smart previews from being able to carry on editing. This is great if you're on a train or a plane and you don't want to fish out the drive from your pocket or your bag, you can just carry on editing. And when you reconnect your drive, uh, you'll be able to export much higher resolution images uh, once the, um, your external drive is connected. Okay, just to finish up, you return home, you've got your, um, all of your photos and your, and your catalog on your laptop, but let's say you're using a desktop computer at home, what do you do with that Lightroom catalog and what you do with all of those photos? And the answer is, is first of all, you can export a catalog to your external drive. This doesn't actually take up much room on your external drive because you're not having to export the photos because the photos are already on the external drive, you're just exporting the catalog data, which is not very large. So you can export that to your external drive and then connecting that external drive to your desktop computer, you choose import from another catalog, you browse to the catalog you just saved to your external drive, and you basically merge those two catalogs together. So all of your data, uh, all of your catalog information on your external drive now becomes part of your master catalog on your desktop computer. So that is a very elegant workflow. And what this does is it allows um, uh, people who don't want to buy two or three external drives just to wipe everything, all the data, 
off that external drive ready for your next uh, big trip out. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stop sharing uh, because I'm going to give plenty of time um, for um, questions. So I'll come back to the Zoom and um, hopefully uh, uh, you've got some questions. I'm sure Mike has probably been looking at the, the chat pod been. and he might sort of uh, pick out some of the more interesting questions. One of the things I should highlight before we start answering questions here that we probably won't get to every single question, but if you head over to my website, which is um, uh, easy to find because it's my name with .com on the end, is uh, if you go down to the download section, you'll find an ebook for a Lightroom workflow. Um, so, you know, you will be supported here and uh, also uh, via my website. Okay, okay, thanks, Mike. Mark, for such a such an awesome presentation. We we have had heaps of questions uh, come through, so I'll, I'll go through as many as I can and do my best to um, to ensure we we answer them. But yeah, as Mark said, you can also send them to us at contact at australianphotography.com if you don't get one get an answer, and feel free to do that, and we'll do our best to get back to you. So, Mark, first question I've got is from Catherine. She says, I'm a huge fan of trying to edit on the iPhone and iPads, but have issues with them transferring onto Apple devices, particularly with raw files. How do you work around this issue? Okay, so it's only the very latest Apple devices that use the USB-C connections that actually can see external drives. Um, the, uh, the PC tablet workflow is um, much uh, friendlier to having external drives connected to that tablet. Um, and that tablet um, makes a lot of sense if you're working with one of those um, um, uh, tablets that can actually see, like the very latest, um, uh, uh, you know, um, Mac, uh, uh, what's it called? The, the Mac tablet is the, uh, the, the pro version with the USB-C connection. It will see. So you can move those uh, files over. The, the workflow prior to this was a little bit complex for using Lightroom on, on, um, on, on, on an iPhone, um, which was, um, you know, you tended to import them and you'd fill up all of your hard drive capacity on your phone. And then you'd have to sort of delete all of the ones that you didn't want uh, and uh, basically move those over to an external drive outside of that area. Now, if you do have good Wi-Fi connections, um, then obviously you, um, Lightroom on a mobile device will start uploading the full resolution raw files to its cloud. Um, but obviously that um, workflow is compromised if you don't have a tablet that can work with external drives and, and you, or you don't have good Wi-Fi connections. So in that instance, I would still probably promote people would be using um, laptops and uh, their external, fast external drives. Mark, I've got a question for you. Why do you think so many photographers struggle with workflows? Um, I don't know. It's, it's like... Um, I think people find the, um, the interface of the develop module of Lightroom super friendly, super easy. They know they can't make mistakes, so they get bold, they can edit, they can reset. But, um, you know, there is, um, because there is no one single workflow for a Lightroom classic workflow, it means there is not one set of rules to follow. And so people will listen, listen to 10 people with 10 different workflows. And that can be horribly confusing. Um, I, I stood back from actually um, uh, recommending a workflow because I realized there wasn't one workflow. But I saw so many people struggle. You know, they didn't know where their catalog was. They, they had their images uh, spread out over five different external devices. They had question marks popping up because one of the big sins when using a Lightroom catalog workflow is to move or rename or delete files with Lightroom not open. And then Lightroom just throws up question marks and exclamation marks. So uh, the first bit of advice is don't do anything to your images outside of Lightroom and try and get a good handle on where your photos are. Try and keep them in one space on one external drive. Uh, increase the size of that external drive if you're working with a catalog. Some photographers will use 
very large RAID drives. So they're not having to unplug and replug different drives, trying to find where their images are. It's one connection. And again, that connection should be a very fast connection if you want to edit those images offline. Having said that, I, you know, if you go to my website, I will recommend one workflow, but I will stress that once you're comfortable with that workflow, feel, feel free to tinker, fine tune, change from a position of understanding of you know why you're doing those changes so mark i've got a question about your photography style can um this is from rob um, and he says does mark prefer to use filters and attempt to capture an image in one shot or does he like to choose to bracket or stack images yeah, I know a lot of photographers, and I've seen this, and you've probably seen this, Mike, there are some photographers overcomplicate things. I will be standing on top of the sand dunes in Cervantes, and people are asking about focus stacking, and I'm going, you don't need to focus stack f11 on a 16 mil ultra wide angle lens. You've got heaps of depth of field. You, And same with um, uh, bracketing. Uh, full frame, and one of the reasons I do like full frame sensors is the dynamic range is often huge. We just um, uh, underexpose slightly, so we protect our highlights, grab that shadow slider and open it up. So much so though, that I you know, almost stopped using you know, graduated neutral density filters. Um, I will, you know, typically I can get everything in a single exposure. Yes, the foreground might be one or two stops underexposed, but the sensors have become increasingly forgiving. Um, you know, the, and, um, and that's what I do basically. I, uh, I remember being in a slot canyon in America last year and I did a nine image bracket on my A7R4 and I ended up just editing the one image that was three stops underexposed and it was just as good as the HDR version. And so I think that and, and they, the, the sensor manufacturers are just promising that the dynamic range will continue to grow. And so things like focus stacking and um, uh, awesome. bracketing will just become things that, you know, we don't have to do. I know focus stacking is really important for macro photographers, but landscape photographers, you know, who, who know about hyperfocal distance is we can grab it in one image. Okay, I've got going to go back to another um, storage workflow question. Um, this is from Catherine. Is there a benefit to importing as copy as DNG rather than just copy? Yeah, it's a little bit of a complex question. Um, the import workflow will slow down slightly because it has to import the raw file and then convert it to a DNG. Um, Lightroom has become better in uh, over the last 12 months that uh, even as it's continuing to import the new raw files, you can start working on the files already imported. But for some people who don't want to slow that down, they'll just choose copy rather than copy as DNG. Having said that, um, one of the file formats that I do use for landscape is uncompressed raw on my Sony cameras. And if I choose DNG, uh, Adobe uses a lossless compression algorithm like Nikon uses a lossless compression algorithm and so the actual size in megabytes of my A7R4 file will drop from 80 megabytes to 40 megabytes and so I'm going to get twice as many files if I've converted to DNG on my one terabyte storage and obviously that makes the one terabyte storage much better value for money and just means I can stay out on location twice as long. If you are a Lightroom editor, there will be some advantage um, to speed. Uh, DNG editing tends to work a little bit quicker. I'm only talking four or five percent here, but you will get a little bit of a performance kick from editing DNG files rather than native raw files. The danger is if you move, if you suddenly decide that I don't want to edit in Lightroom, I want to abandon ship and go to one of Adobe's competitors, you know, have you done the sensible thing? You know, will uh, a DNG is an open file format, but they have to pay a license fee to Adobe to use it. And if they're trying to save money, maybe they won't recognize that DNG file format. Mark, I've got a question from Meryl, um, and she's asked, um, how many catalogs do you make? Do you just have one or do you, do you use multiple catalogs? Okay, so um, yeah, I do have multiple catalogs and it used to be important in days of old that um, catalogs did slow down uh, once you had got like a quarter of a million images in them. 
they did start to get slower. Again, Lightroom worked on this. So, you know, the modern versions of the CC Lightroom uh, do allow uh, much bigger catalogs before slowing down. Typically, I have one master catalog that I go to where I know I can find all of my images. Um, but I do also tend to work with a smaller catalog, which is on my laptop, which are just images that I've shot this year. I know um, I also got a demonstration catalog so that I'm I'm not connecting to a you know um, 24 terabytes worth of images when I open the catalog. I'm just working with the images I want to um, use as teaching tools. So typically um, a small catalog on my laptop, a master catalog on my desktop, and maybe a demo catalog. You can break out a catalog from a big catalog. You just right click on a folder or a group of folders and say make a catalog from these it's a very easy operation in Lightroom so Mark we've had um, a few technical questions about oh I've just gone dark here uh, <laughs> we've had a few technical <laughs> questions about Sanders products yeah. Yeah. Um, or just ask people to email those through to us and we'll put them to the Sanders team is probably the best bet for those yeah um, I've, we've had a question from Jenny, which I think is, um, there we go, there was light, there um, was which light. is quite good. Yeah. You've got, um, have you got is, lights that automatically shut down of you when you yeah, don't move? That's the one. <laughs> um, her question is, do you think it's easier to introduce Bridge first to students and then later Lightroom? And maybe there's something more about for people who are getting started, what do you suggest that they start with when it comes to editing and okay, managing yeah. their files? You, you won't even get a clear answer from uh, Adobe uh, engineers on this one you know one of the two most important people at adobe working in the imaging is russell preston brown he's one of the um, original testers and then you've got julianne cost who's the evangelist um, and uh, russell preston brown doesn't use bridge and um, uh, julianne cost only uses lightroom you are doubling up if you use both I think that's that can be tricky. What happens is Lightroom sees that another raw um, editor has been looking at the files and will sometimes throw up uh, curious question marks going, do you want to import the edit or overwrite the edit? And that can be a little bit confusing. So I think my first recommendation is choose one and stick to it. Lightroom is obviously was designed after Bridge. Bridge, I think, is designed for people who are using multiple pieces of Adobe software and need to, I mean, they called it Bridge. It's like the bridge on Star Trek. You basically got, um, or the bridge on a ship, you're looking at, uh, you're overseeing all file formats, whether they're images or not. So you can look at your Illustrator files, your Premiere files, you can look at all files. But if you're only a photographer, it sort of makes sense these days just to be in Lightroom. Mark, we had a question um, that's just come in from someone asking about, I'm just sorry, just trying to find it, um, that was asking about using RAW on mobile. Um, sorry, that was from, from Rob. What are, you, what, what are your thoughts on when you're shooting with mobile about shooting in RAW versus just JPEG in, in device? Yeah, that's a curious one. Look, the um, uh, it does that the advantages of RAW tends to reduce um, as the size of the sensor gets smaller. Generally, uh, one of the things that RAW shooters know is we've got some elbow room. Um, we can re we can recover some of the highlight information that the JPEG may have clipped or overexposed. But um, that, that um, uh, headroom that we see in the raw files of APS-C and full frame cameras tends to disappear by the time you get smaller than um, APS or sort of micro four thirds size. So look, it is, um, if you are going to be aggressive in your editing, they will be more robust at grading, like if you want to darken your sky significantly, if it is a JPEG, you'll start getting that blocking, like the Minecraft blocking that starts to appear when you've basically over edited a file that was already edited by the camera. So if you are gonna be a little bit aggressive in your editing, um, such as you're grading your images, and changing them significantly, yes, the RAW does have an advantage, but if you're just tweaking the file, you just, you know, um, tweaking uh, the, the contrast and the saturation, then you're not going to get much of an advantage from having just let the camera shoot a JPEG file. 
Mark, I'm going to ask you one last question because we're out of time. Right. Um, but you know, anyone else who hasn't had their question answered, please email it through to us and we'll do our best to, to answer it. Um, my question though to you, Mark, is what do you think the benefits are of having an external drive that you carry with you all the time? I think it's that, um, look, you know, in the old days of the, the three, two, one rule, um, the three, two, one as rule has changed over time. It used to be, uh, burn everything to a DVD and leave it at your mum's house. You know, it's like that's offside, but of course, you know, um, you know, we got 5g coming, you know, and so the cloud is going to be more important, but I'm still going lots of places in the world where, you know, motels, you know, unless you give them lots of money for a faster connection, you're not going to be uploading raw files. Remember the mobile versions of Lightroom don't upload small versions like Classic. When you sync a raw file in Classic, it just uploads the smart preview. It's like a one megabyte raw file. But if I'm syncing um, A7R4 files, I'm going to be uploading 80 megabyte ARW files over a dodgy Wi-Fi. So I've got to put them on um, a drive and I don't want to wait an hour while the, uh, the laptop moves them to my external drive before I can go out for dinner. I want to, I want to have empty that card. And as you see, the maximum time I've got to wait is 10 minutes. So by the time I've jumped out of the shower, you know, I can pop that external drive. I can put it in that little clip. I can put it on my belt, um, even if I fall down drunk in the evening. Uh, so long as I'm wearing my trousers in the morning, I'm still going to have my photos of my breaching whales or whatever. And so it's just it's just security. It's um, and having a, a drive that is um, weatherproof, obviously shockproof, is just that extra um, insurance policy. Some people who are really nervous will carry two of those two drives and they'll basically have a mirror version of that external drive. And uh, they might give one to a traveling companion or put one in the hotel safe and then uh, travel with the other one. It really depends, you know, how, how much sleep you will lose over when you're worried about using your once in a lifetime trip. Well, we're at the end. Um, Mark, thank you so much for your brilliant presentation and your informative answers to everyone. Again, anyone who has questions that we didn't get to, please feel free to send them through to us. And um, there's also a survey we're gonna send out tomorrow morning. Now there might be a little giveaway if you complete that survey too. So look out for that around nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Giveaway but, city. <laughs> giveaway city here. But no, thank you so much to everyone who came along. This is our first webinar and um, it's been so great to have such a good attendance for it. So we, we really appreciate you guys joining us tonight. Thanks a lot okay, and, and uh, see you soon. Thank you for listening to me talk for 40 minutes. Okay, cheers, right, bye.